Okay, hello everyone. I'm Yarishia Tiggs. I'm the mental health program lead for CASA. Um, today we have with us Dr. Kwaku Smith. Um, you want to give a little introduction about yourself, a little bit about your background, and you know how you got started um, in mental health and mental performance work. Yeah, so I'm just real quick. Born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I got my PhD <laughs> from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, back way back in 2003. And so actually, I thought I was going to be a school psychologist. But when I did my internship, I went into the Department of Corrections, where it's one of those things where it's like a double-edged sword. It's like you fall in love, but you fall in love for the wrong reasons. It was so many of us. I was like, OK, yeah. I can do some work here. So I kind of laid in that area. And I worked in the um, Corrections Department for about seven, five, about five years, rather. I was like, man, this is hard because you see the, you know, the recidivation that revolving door. You said, let me do some things on the front end. So I started working at Children's Hospital where I was working with young children. I was like, okay, I'm gonna be on the front end of it. But when I started doing that, I was like, these are all of the children that the parents were just work with. These are all the children who were mm. in special education. You just see this pipeline going. So I'll be honest, it was just a frustration. I was like, I don't even want to do this. I don't, I don't know what's going on. So I wrote a book called Building a Better Man. And in that book, I started kind of going around the nation talking about it. I was like, well, maybe I'll do this. So in my business, you know, you have your little side hustle. So I have my little business on the side. So I'm going to do it full time. Started working, but my first client out of the blue was the Milwaukee Bucks. So the, the biggest thing was people said, how did that come about? Like, yeah. this works in the city. And this is where I tell people, like, if you do good work, people will find you. And so inside of my city, I did a free television cable show for like 10 years. It's called Ask the Blacksmith, where we talked on all things mental health. I would do radio interviews. I would go on kind of like the local mental health person. And so people started to know you. And so they had had some people inside of their industry who knew me. They asked me to come on just to help them with a few things. And then it kind of turned into something good. And then it turned into a full-time obligation. Well, within the sports world, another thing you learn is this. <laughs> I hope, but on the safety net, that's probably not the place you want to be. So after two and a half years, yeah. I'm looking like, what is it that I want to do? But well, because I had such a strong clinical and school psychology background, I said, you know what? I'm going to continue to do my business. But there were so many other things that I love still working with athletes. So I got a chance to work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I absolutely mm -hmm. fell in love with the student athletes there. It was a different level of purity of sports, but it was there also that I recognized the unique uh, issues that our student athletes go through. And so I was so excited yeah. about the interview today to talk about like what it is, because so many people think, oh, you're still an athlete, you got it going on, you got this, you don't have a yeah. problem. And the more you go into that world, you start to see, wow. And even though, even though NIL deals are here and the portal is here that gives you a little bit more flexibility, it's still mm -hmm. a lot of things that the average person, even a lot of parents, don't understand that comes with not only just scholarships, but non-scholarship individuals who work on a hard basis every day. No, yeah, definitely agree. I always say Division three athletes are some of the strongest athletes because they go not expecting any scholarships, not any money, but they're going just for the love of the sport. So it's, it's definitely a lot. <laughs> no, you know, it's definitely a lot. A lot. I, went, I went to a D3 school, and I remember football coach used to ask me to come play all the time, and I would start, and I'd do the workouts, and I'm like, I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> I'm not doing it. And it was so many other fun things to do on the campus. Like, yeah. you, I tell people, if you're going to be a student athlete, you can do two or three things well. You can be a good student and you can be a good athlete. And that in itself is hard. But if you want to have mm -hmm. a social life and a social component, very rarely have I been able to see many people navigate all three of those aspects of being a good student, being a great athlete, and then being great within the college community, living that college life. And I knew which two I wanted to do. So it was a no brainer. But for those who don't yeah. go into the athletic realm, I have so much respect because even if you are, I tell people, no matter what you make in a scholarship, and this is a little pre-NIL, there's no amount of money that you're making. And even with these NIL, the, the, the universities and institutions are making way more than what, what they're giving you in any state. So it's still not a fair equity. No, yeah, for sure. Definitely agree with you on that. Um, okay, let's get into our first question here. Um, <laughs> so why is mental health important and why should it be important to student athletes? Yeah, well, mental health is important uh, for everybody. So regardless if you're an athlete or, or you know, um, just a regular student, 
you still want to be able to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And I think mental health scares people. So I think first we need to define what really what mental health is. And it's really this big spectrum, this umbrella that goes from mental wellness to mental illness. And most time when people hear mental health, they hear mental illness, but not just mental illness. They see the person you know, who wants to commit suicide, the person who's hearing voices, the person who's so depressed, they can't get out the bed. He would be like, I'm not crazy. I don't need that. I don't need mental health. And that's where I think we do a disservice. Mental health is just about caring for ourselves. So when we talk about self-care and self-love, that's the essence of mental health. So if I'm doing good, let me continue to find the things that make me feel great and make me feel good. Let me be proactive in these strategies. But if I'm not feeling good, let me do something before it goes down to a point where I am nervous. And if it does get to that point, let me have the courage and let me please have a circle of people around me that care enough to get me to those places that can give me the appropriate help that I need. When we look throughout our world, there's so many people who deal on that negative end of mental illness. But if it's done properly, you can still have such a beautiful life. What happens is, is when we go through that mental illness time and we don't have the courage or we don't have the knowledge or the information to seek out the help, and then we deteriorate to a point where now it's more difficult to get help. No, yeah, for sure. Um, so speaking of the mental illness, um, we hear the term generational trauma brought up a lot these days, um, especially for black and brown people in America. Um, can you talk a little bit about what is generational trauma and how it affects black and brown student athletes? Yeah. Well, whenever we look at uh, racism, you say, this is in the soil of America. There's a great movie out right now called Origin by Ava DuVernay. Um, and it's based on a book called Cats by Isabel Wilkerson. And what they talk about inside of these two um, pieces of uh, medium and communication is what's the origins of racism? And once you start to see the origins, now the question becomes, how does this affect each generation? If you look at the, the research, people will tell you that we can hold up to 14 generations of DNA within our body. So just think about that. Oh, when wow. you start to say, yes, when you start to say, okay, well, no, I've never experienced slavery. No, my mother never even experienced slavery. But when you go back just a few generations, you're like, wow, we're not so far out of that. And not only just the, mm -hmm. the period of enslavement, but also our Jim Crow. And even now today, we still experience police brutality. We still experience redlining. And when you bring that into the college world, let's just be very honest. The college world was exposed during COVID because when we saw a lot of the things that was going COVID, a lot of the student athletes were having a very difficult time. And the coaches who are usually very proud, very bold, knows all the answers, but one of the first times was able to say, I don't know exactly what to do. Now you put that at the intersection of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of Ahmaud Aubrey with the social justice that was going on and college campuses was exploding. And the people from the ADs all the way down to the coaches didn't know how to handle the athletes. And you said, well, why is that so important? Because that means how they were handling us before was fraudulent. It was tip of the iceberg. That means everything is good. And what mostly happens on a lot of colleges is they'll separate the athletes. You know, hey, you're an athlete, mm -hmm. stay over here. So you're shielded from some of the other things and you live in this kind of placebo, you live in this kind of world where you say, oh, everything is good because I don't see everything that's affected. We do have a team and we do have a family where some of those things on the outside world doesn't matter. But even when you come back down to it, you will see a lot of the players say, hmm, what would I be if I didn't have this athletic ability? Would the coaches still be there for me? For those with extreme talent, you get so much love, you, you never get to find out. But for those who yeah. have lower levels of talent, they start to see, wow, the resources aren't the same for me. Oh, look at how I was treated from here. Because once you're in it, you're a little blind. But once you mm -hmm. step back for a year, two years, five years, and you start to notice, wow, I was so blind that I didn't see this discrepancy here. Because that's what that's what beautiful racism is. And I say that in a sarcastic way, it's covert. You don't see it. Yeah. You're blinded by all of the other beautiful things that's going on. And so when we started to talk about what is it, why is it so important for our students there? Because when you're on a team and then you go into class and that class and that university looks nothing like you, or yet you still struggle with some of the same things, we still see these things on college campuses today. And a lot of times what our athletes are, they're shielded from it 
where they told, don't worry about it. That's not your issue. Don't get involved. And I always say yeah. the telltale sign where you know that athletes are muzzled is you go back a few years back, when Colin Kaepernick would take a knee. You never saw that really spread like wildfire on the college campuses. And usually, if you look within civil rights, it's always the young people who are the most what invincible, the most ones who are going to change. Yeah. Says, I'm not taking what my parents are doing. It was communicated to them that if you take a knee, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. Yeah, we had gloss over conversations. Is what we call a rhetorical assurance, false promises. We talk about it like things will be done, but really not a lot mm -hmm. done. And that's not to say nothing was done, but was enough done to be able to really make other people feel great. And the reason why we know that it's an issue, because we have groups like this. There would be no need for groups yeah. such as this if everything was equitable on all fields, because all student athletes need a mental health awareness. But for, for Black and Brown, and for those in mm -hmm. other, in other um, ostracized, marginalized groups, they need their special affinity groups. And I always tell any institution, if you need an affinity group, in any of your organizations, that's a telltale sign that all of your people don't feel comfortable to breathe freely in every aspect of the um, area where they're at. No, oh, yeah, I definitely agree. I've always found it interesting um, seeing how not a lot of Black student athletes were like a part of the Black Student Union. Um, when you go to different colleges, it'd be like, they will may they might stop in at the event, maybe, but like, they, you never expected the athletes to show up to Black Student Union events. And I've always found that connection to be kind of questionable, but also now that you explain it, it makes a lot more sense. They, just, like, they keep a tight schedule for certain reasons. Some athletes you do want to have on a tight schedule because you don't want other things to happen. But it's also like, mm -hmm. hey, if you go over here and you're easily deployed, what does that do to my locker room? Yeah. So, so it's about once you have other factions, it, it separates the team and coaches. I'm very, very aware of that. That's interesting, actually. I just got a whole new perspective on something. <laughs> um, all right. So to lead into our next question, um, according to the fall 2021 NCAA student athlete well-being survey, fewer than half. So to be exact, 47 percent of student athletes. <laughs> That was a school bell. 47% of student athletes felt they would be comfortable personally seeking support from a mental health provider on campus. Why do you believe student athletes aren't comfortable seeking that mental health support on their campuses? And, uh, like we said before, mental health is taboo. So whether you're a student athlete or student, most counseling centers just aren't utilized the way they could. Number two, when you go, sometimes the people there don't look like you. You say, oh, I want to go, but I don't know. Really, is this yeah. is going to be helpful? And then three, because you're wondering how confidential is this? You know, if somebody mm -hmm. really comes up onto you and asks you questions about me, what are they going to say? And I hear all of my athletes always say the best ability is availability. So whether it's a physical illness or mental illness, coaches care, but they don't care as it relates on the play. So if there's a possibility that you could not be with the team and there's somebody who's competing for your position, well, I'm going to go with that other person and the athletes know that. So they shy away from it because it looks like it's a matter of weakness. So what we have to do is to be able to bring one, uh, a level of destigmatization to mental health in general, two, bring mm -hmm. more clinicians of color, even if you're not in the university, but that can collaborate with people inside of the, the city. And then three, make sure that the coaches understand how important this is and to really understand it. And I think the way we get the coaches to understand it is to make sure that they have mental health professionals too. Because as yeah, they yeah. start to access it, one, it lightens their emotional load, but two, now they understand the important confidentiality. Now they understand that it doesn't mean we want it even makes me better. So now you're looking at the athletes who might utilize that in a different manner, but also you appreciate the sanctity and the beauty around it specifically the confidentiality. No, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, the amount of coach burnout I've seen, <laughs> it's it's crazy. Um, I feel like they, they're definitely left out the conversation a lot when it comes to mental health in the athletic world. Um, so you make some really valid points with that one. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier, we talked about generation trauma, um, and then you just touched on how, you know, black student athletes can go into the mental health spaces and don't see anybody that looks like them. Um, so specifically, 
um, those student athletes who are in the African diaspora community, um, a lot of times they feel pressure to conform, especially if they attend a PWI. Um, why do you think this is and what can they do to not feel the pressure to conform in those spaces? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if it's just the pressure to conform, but association brings on assimilation. So the more you're around something, the more it becomes normal and the more it mm -hmm. seems like it's just a regular because that's what you're seeing on a regular basis. And so I think what you want to do is to make sure for those campuses, specifically the PWI, is to make sure that the individuals who they recruit do have an area in which they can feel comfortable, in which they can completely be themselves. But it, oftentimes, the biggest thing that the coaches see is not the color. What they see is the colors of that school. And that's because it's different bottom lines for the players and the coaches, different ramifications. So it behooves them for you to come into one group, specifically the team, even if that means losing a part of yourself. So I think it really comes with an education of the coaches, with the administration staff to say, hey, we're developing a whole person, not just an athlete. And I think if they look at the individual as a whole and not just an athlete, which is hard with the monies that's around it, that's part of yeah. the problem. If we can do that, it could be a little bit better. Thank you for that. Um, so now I kind of want to switch and talk a little bit about some mental performance. Um, so what is the difference between mental health and mental performance professionals? Um, I think a lot of student advocates get confused on when they should seek out mental health professional and when should they seek out a mental mental performance professional. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the difference and when athletes should be seeking, seeking out which professional? Yeah. So first, what I want to say is it can be confusing because it is. So if you think like a Venn diagram where you have the two circles, there is a you know point in the middle where both can do those <laughs> things. So when you're talking about a mental health clinician, you're talking about a person who's able to diagnose a disorder, the depression, the anxiety, ADHD, things of that nature, and then be able to give you psychotherapy to be able to help you to maneuver with different interventions to help. When we talk about a performance coach, when we're talking about somebody within that realm, now we're talking about a person who's going to help you as it relates to visual imagery, who's mm -hmm. going to help you with guided imagery, who's going to help you with self-talk, who's going to help you with focus and mental toughness and things of that nature. This is a person who focuses specifically on the game. This is outside of clinical diagnosis. But what's going to make me a better athlete? What's going to allow me to maximize my potential? Now, you have some people who have the ability and the certification to do both. That's generally what they're not looking for in a lot of the, the institutions. So you don't have to decide, like, which one do I go to? It's just I go mm -hmm. to this person, and this is what we'll talk about today. This is what the bigger issue is tomorrow. But at the end of the day, I tell people, you can have certifications, and I think certifications are good to let people know, oh, this person is certified. But we also mm -hmm. know that sometimes certifications has been used as gatekeepers to keep out the people who are very helpful. So what I tell yeah. athletes to do is to look for the person who you know, one, you can count on, who you can mm -hmm. believe in, and who trusts you and who help you. And if they can't, that trusted person will say, let me take you to a person to give you something that I can't give you. And then that's where you start to go. But the first thing is you have to build a level of trust with those people inside. And if it's not anybody within those categories, talk to somebody who you trust, who can get you to somebody, who can get you the direct help that you need. Thank you. Um, so to kind of follow up with that, we you touched on earlier um, that it might not be professionals that look like the student athletes, and that can be a barrier to them reaching out and can, asking can I for say help. Something real quick. No, you yes. Know, I want to make sure everybody understands this quickly. Uh, you can work with somebody who doesn't look like you, and they can still. Mm -hmm. I believe for I believe sure. There's no greater weapon than the weapon of love. And I've seen some people with different pigmentation levels in mind, but I saw the love, I saw the care, I saw the tension, I saw the professionalism. So I don't want to say that, oh, just because somebody doesn't look exactly like me, they can't help mm -hmm. me. But that person who doesn't look like you, and I don't care if it's a difference between gender, if it's a difference between race, if it's a difference between orientation, between religions or whatnot like that, that person has to be culturally competent enough to understand what these differences are. Or what are the ways that I can help you? And once I see that I've maxed out, how do I get you to the appropriate source? Yeah, I think the key word there was the cultural competence, um, which is something that's newer in the mental health field. A lot of professionals um, are getting trained to have the cultural competence um, aspect. Because it's been going for a while. Because we're not doing it. And so, yeah. Because you talk about racism, that's what racism is again. 
you get into a system, mm -hmm. it's a cookie cutter, and it's what's built for what? It's still America, still built for the WASP, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So anything that's built, you got to kind of conform to that. And if you don't, it's like, it's like you fit in. We, most of the time, we're not going to squeeze in and fit yeah. you. Because we'll say, hey, we have five clinicians here. You didn't go see none. Yeah, but I didn't like them. Yeah, but we have. And so that, that's the, the paradox and the dilemma so many athletes are in. You're telling me we have them, but I'm telling you, I don't like them. So, so who wins? They say, well, we do because we done what we're supposed to do. We check this box. And yeah. if you don't go through it, that's on you. But that's and so that's actually comes in again. No, yeah. That's a perfect um lead way to the next question is how can student advocates advocate for mental health? Rather it's there on their campuses, you know, the university are checking off the boxes like the services here, you're just not using it. How can student advocates say, I need more. I need more of this. I need more of that. Like what you're providing me isn't enough. How can student uh, student athletes go about advocating? If you go back to, to um, 2020 with COVID, you saw the athletes recognize again how powerful their voices are if what if they're in unity. So what you need mm -hmm. to do is to have a large enough group to be able to go to the coaches, to the administration, and say, "This is what we want. You want us to be happy. You want us to help us to recruit. You want us to." to be able to be on this campus and grow to our maximum ability, not only as an athlete, but as an individual, these are the things that we're giving you. And what I tell the young people is then, do your research. Find out where they're doing it yeah. big. Eh? Find out where they're doing it. They say, hey, listen, this is where they're doing it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, look, here's some people right here across the thing. Why can't we bring them in? Why can't we utilize these resources? Because the question is, is not, can we find it? The question is there is, do we want to find it? And are we willing mm. to invest financially what it may take? And I always tell people, you show me your budget, I'll show you where your heart is at. Because you can tell me how much you mm -hmm. can, but let me see your budget, where you allocate funds, and that's going to be it. But once the athletes, again, understand their unified, the power of their unified voice, and then bring in a collective one of, of needs and demands, things that are reasonable and realistic, how can an institution not listen if they're worthy? Yeah. I'm happy you talked um, a little bit about the athletics department like budgets because uh, we had this question submitted uh, via our Instagram. How can athletic departments support student athletes in a cost efficient way? Yeah, well, I think every nobody wants to overspend. But yeah. it's also when you look around the campus, you see where overspending is at. And you said, <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> in certain areas, I want to make sure that I at least get it right. If I'm going to overspend, mm -hmm. I'm going to overspend here where I see we need. And this is the sad part. We see the number of suicides. We see the number mm -hmm. of attempted suicides. We see the number of high levels of depression. So even for those who don't um, die by suicide or attempt it, you still see scores and scores and scores of individuals who walk around with depression. I tell you, when I see domestic violence within student athletes, when I see DWIs within student athletes, when I see um, dirty urine analysis and things that I mean. I said, these are all manifestations yeah. and cry outs of mental health. So I said, mm -hmm. now the question is, you have a reason to allocate that budget because you have a serious concern within your school. And I tell people, once there is a suicide, guess what? Somebody's getting sued. Now your budget is going to change. Now you're going to hire these people because what is going to be a demand because the spotlight is on why don't you learn from the mistakes of other companies, excuse me, of other um, universities? They say, let us mm -hmm. be proactive in this. And so when you say our budget, yeah. let's allocate this amount of money towards these individuals. They'll say, hey, we have five um, staff, five psychologists on staff. I said, but you got over 300 athletes. So some people don't go see them because they know the wait list is too long. How am I going to see mm -hmm. 300 people? Really, leg legitimately, if I'm on a thing and I have five teams, how am I going to see all of those students legitimately? And so when you look at a team, you see they have an athletic trainer, they have a physical mm -hmm. trainer, they have all of these different things. But then when it comes to mental health, you got one for eight sports, one for you nine have one. And yes. Like, oh, it doesn't even make sense logistically. So if you would be mm -hmm. pulled up, just imagine what could be done where you would even, and this is the thing from a fiscal standpoint, if you're proactively um, in this matter of being fiscally aggressive, it saves you on the back end. And not only for money, but who wants to be at an institution where we have to tell a parent, I'm sorry, you have to come up because your son is no longer with us, because your daughter is no longer with us. Nobody wants to have that conversation. And so now what we yeah. have to do is what can we do proactively 
to be able to not just to keep people from not harming themselves, but again, that wellness on that part of mental health to make them be the best of themselves. So when they leave here, there are people who matriculate after four years and you say, this is a different human being or for the better. You want them to be able to look back on their collegiate experience and say, this place made me a better athlete, but more importantly, it made me a better person. I really feel that they cared about me and not just me, but everybody yeah. inside of here. No, yeah, for sure. When I usually look um, at university staff directories, um, I usually see only one mental health professional or <laughs> one mental performance professional. And it's just like, yeah. Three psychologists would get added up. And it's just, it's unfair yeah. to the children. I'll tell you why it's unfair and it's dishonest. Because they tell the parents, we have a mental health program. We're going to look out for your child. And yeah, technically, they're telling the truth. But from a theoretical standpoint, but practically, there's no way that every athlete could utilize the services on any campus in America. No, yeah. Good points. Points are being made. <laughs> Gems are being dropped right now. <laughs> um, our next question also came um, from our Instagram. Um, how can athletes prevent their athletic performance from overly affecting their mental health? Uh, you see, that's where you want to get with your performance goes because it's hard because we believe there's so much tied to your identity. You know, I'm looking yeah. at the, the NFL season and these kickers miss these field goals. Everybody giving them death threats. So how can that not yes. affect you? And I was watching uh, women's basketball and I was looking, um, I won't say her name, but there's a young lady. She's really, really good. She plays for a team in the Midwest. And I'm seeing a crowd mm -hmm. of 30,000 people boo this young lady. So she shoots yes. an air ball. And like, yeah, ball. And it's like, we forget that these young people are still young it, people. So you say, humans. Oh, can I not yeah. let it? Or what you want to do is you have to recognize live in a sick society. Sometimes when people over-exaggerate the importance of sports and because they don't have a great life, everything is invested in this. So you got to learn how do I block out certain things. And it's not easy, but I think that comes into the, to three things we can do. One, having a great social support, people who you know, who love you. What's my inner circle? Only the people in this inner circle can really get to me. Everybody else, I'm learning how to block out. As hard as that is, that's what I'm doing. But number two, I'm more than an athlete. Because now what I'm recognizing is, hey, I can't be a scholar athlete. I got something else going on. Yes. That, you know, this is here. And then the third thing is, there is a level of mental toughness that we develop just as far as a person to understand, hey, something bad happens. How do I now use this for fuel to the fire for the next time? Mm-hmm. I feel like one of the first things I learned um, from being an athlete and just being an athletic girl was you're not a human anymore. <laughs> like you have to be perfect all the time. And if you're not perfect, then you're going to get ridiculed. And I was just like, hold on. I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, I didn't sign and, up for and, that. <laughs> it's an unfortunate burden, you know, because you, you have a yeah. superhero strengths in one area and people expect like you to be on all the time. Like they can't be at all. Yes. But when you go off, like, oh, this is why I'm, but that also goes into parenting because sometimes parents that didn't make it to that level, they somewhat make my child, sure they do. And they live vicariously through the child. So the child carries mm -hmm. not only weight of themselves, but through the families, through the friends. Yeah. And if they are in a, 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 a revenue generating sport where they can maybe go on to another level, these other responsibilities of physically or excuse me, financially taking on the family become so much more. And I think it's just so important that as we start with our youth, so even before we get to college, like if we're just starting with dealing with mental health and mental performance, we've already waited to it. Just like we, yeah. we train our coaches, these professional certified coaches at the Little League era, we need to make sure mental health is implemented at that standpoint so they grow up in a healthy environment. They understand what is healthy, what is not, and then they understand how to leave, how to be able to maneuver. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, these, these children are so soft, they're going through the portal. No, their environment is toxic, and they're intelligent enough to know that they have choices, and they utilize them. That's a very healthy environment. And now it's the difference between running because it's too hot and the heat, and I've talked to my athletes about that. Yeah. It's a type of the thing. You know, you can't just run and when it gets there because that generalizes into your life. But if it's an unhealthy environment, and I mean like literally unhealthy for many reasons, why mm -hmm. would you take that option? Is that's not your that goes into your um, heroism again? 
I'm gonna sneak it out. I'm gonna sneak. No. Nah. Mm -mm. It's a time. It's a, it's a, it, it's biblical almost. It's a time to stay. It's a time to leave. It's a time to go. It's a time to come. So you have to be able to discern that though with the level of wisdom. And if you can't, but again, that intimate circle to be able to say, who can I trust? Who can I talk to? Yes. A few more questions. Um, next one also came from our Instagram. What practices can student athletes utilize to control their anxiety? But that's going to be different for everybody. So I don't want to give a cookie cutter approach because, you know, mm -hmm. how anxiety looks for you is going to look different for me. But some of the things that we do, you say, well, I thought you weren't going to give me cookie cutter. Well, let me give you something anyway, just to start <laughs> off. With. But the first thing what I'll say is talk with somebody so they can individualize it to your idiosyncratic need. But the first thing what we start to do is, is what we call visualization. We start to visualize mm -hmm. ourselves being in that situation. I see it. I do it. I feel good about it. Other thing what we do is we talk about how do we do what with our breathing? How do we control our breathing? What's my, yeah. my, my techniques to be able to get my heart blood ratio down? One quick thing that we do oftentimes before games really with people is what we call a five, four, three, two, one. We get people to focus on five things they can see, four things they can hear, three things they can touch, two things they can smell, one thing they can taste. And by doing that concentration, it's a mindfulness, it's a meditation to it. It helps you to stop thinking about all those other things and to calm you down and to hear. And so, yeah. and so, so when we start talking about that, but also it's the pregame things. What do we do? Just like we have a, a, a pregame with um, our working out, and then we have a postgame recovery. I tell everybody that I'm working on, I say, let's get that. You know, we talk about the music. People say, well, I got my pregame tape. I got my hype. It's beautiful. But what are all the other things that go with the pregame? So now let's just do the music, but let's do everything mm -hmm. else that's going to get us in that right space that goes back to the yeah. visualization. And right. But then what's more important is that post-recovery. What's my anxiety to let me down? The game is over now. Got all this adrenaline. How do I calm down? And how do I learn from everything that just happened? So when I start this cycle again, I got, I'm armed with information. So I'm not just making these hypotheses without information. Now I can make an educated guess based on real solid actual data. Nope. Yep. I agree. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, and this, these tips, even like they work for everybody, even if you're not a student athlete, like these are just tips in general oh, to help you calm down. Like yeah. <laughs> like, these are just, yes. Help. It didn't work last time. So, um, so let me try something different. Let me talk to other people. What is it? So yeah, I love it. All right. <laughs> All right, and then last question, um, and then I'll let you get back to your very, very busy schedule. <laughs> um, any advice you have for coaches, administrators, student athletes, just overall surrounding mental health? Um, what would you say overall? You know, I think just listen to this again, because the questions that was asked by the individuals give you the answers. So many times mm -hmm. adults think we have the answer. I'm going to tell you what's best for you. No, go to the source. Go talk to the people who are there and give them a real environment to be able to ask if it has to be an anonymous question box or if it is an open kind of, you know, like town hall type of situation where I say, don't tell us what you think we want to hear, but tell us what you really need us to hear. And then for those athletic directors, those university presidents, those coaches, start talking to your colleagues. What are you doing? I see you got something good working here. I look at different places. And we always used to say, when I worked in the NBA, they say it's a copycat league. So if you see some team doing something that work, guess what? Some other team about to implement that. So it's the same thing. And <laughs> says, if you see something working, make sure you do it. Yeah. And the last thing I can tell them, don't be afraid to invest in it. You know, you put your money where your mouth is. Don't tell me you care about mental health and then mental health is less than 1% of your budget. And that was a truth bomb. <laughs> Just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for giving me 30 minutes of your time today. Um, really appreciate it. You dropped a lot of very valuable information that not only me, <laughs> this is very helpful for me, um, but I know our student advocates um, that work with CAS are definitely going to take a lot of information away from this. So thank you very much. No, uh, hey, tell them ongoing communication. Don't let this be the only thing where you do a one and done and then, oh, yeah. Oh, Ongoing. Ongoing. Yep. All right. Thank you again. I'll catch up with you later. Have a good one. Appreciate you, Queen. <laughs>